Good morning. I'm Katherine Walker, and I'm delighted to be speaking to you on a topic that affects all of us in litigation, electronic discovery and how to handle tremendous volumes of data, often in a contentious and highly emotional uh, arena. After placing the issue in context, I'm going to discuss three common e-discovery challenges or problems and hopefully provide some practical uh, and creative cures or solutions to help tame the e-discovery beast that we all face. Each day, almost unimaginable creation or quantities of data are created, short, stored, and shared. Even before arriving today, I expanded my own digital footprint by sending some emails, texts, working on a reply that I have to file when I go home next week, and also leaving some voicemails. And I suspect that you all had a morning that looked a lot like that, and it's only you know, 9 o'clock-ish. So all of us, over and over and over, are uh, adding to this huge digital footprint. On a global basis, on a, across the world on a daily basis, uh, Google is processing 3.5 billion requests. People are asking all sorts of questions and putting it into the search engine. Facebook, 300 million pictures are being uploaded each day on a daily basis. The same is true for businesses. We're finding uh, an average office worker is sending and receiving between 150 to 300 emails each day, as well as creating all sorts of PowerPoints, uh, Word documents, analyzing data, and moving it around the company. The nature of litigation, right? It feels like this is how we spend our days, <laughs> over a conference table uh, arguing with somebody. Uh, litigation is highly adversarial. It's emotional. People want to win. The stakes are high, and maybe even the very existence of the company is, is at stake. And lawyers are not always a trusting bunch of people, right? We're skeptical. So in this context, uh, parties want to use every advantage they have to gain some sort of strategic uh, uh, benefit for their client. One way is weaponizing discovery, to inflict pain on their opponent, uh, rather than actually using discovery to do what it's intended to do, right? To figure out the facts of your case. So when tremendous volumes of data are thrown into this context, it creates a perfect storm where litigants are forced to sort through haystacks of data, gigantic volumes, to find the needles of relevance. And you're doing this in a shortened period of time and in generally a hostile environment. So tired of these disputes, the courts, along with many e-discovery practitioners, including myself, have been advocating a spirit of cooperation and transparency. They want litigants to, litigants to play well in the sandbox together, particularly uh, given the high stakes. The Southern District of New York in William Gross noted that electronic discovery requires cooperation between opposing counsel and transparency in all aspects of preservation and production of electronically stored information. And while this directive is entirely correct and certainly aspirational, in practice, it's a lot harder to achieve, right? It's the nature of litigation and the varied uh, levels of comfort and competence. And frankly, if, if the parties were able to get along, they probably wouldn't be in litigation anyway. So sometimes before we get too far down the pike in, in a matter, I'll oftentimes talk to my opposing counsel and just say, listen, we are going to be spend a lot of time over the next couple of years probably together. And we're going to have a lot of real substantive legal issues to fight about. Let's try to set aside the e-discovery piece and work as cooperatively as possible. Sometimes, in fact, it helps to have a good cop, bad cop in that mix and set aside a separate e-discovery team uh, where the e-discovery lawyers are working with uh, a, a similar team on the other side and then let the substantive issues be fought separately. They work well together. That has helped in many cases. Sometimes it works better than others, but it's always uh, helpful to be efficient and transparent. So this brings us to challenge number one. Despite the fact that virtually all of our data in, in litigation is now in digital format, many lawyers are still uncomfortable in this context. So what happens, following human nature, uh, people put their head in the sand with respect to e-discovery issues until they really actually have to deal with it, right? 
So that happens when you receive your discovery requests. You know they're going to happen, but we always kick it down the, the, down the road. So the problem is, with delay and lack of attention, rather than helping the problem, right, it's usually the root of a lot of other problems. People don't want to deal with things that make them uncomfortable. Or you're going to put out the fire that you have on your desk today rather than prevent the fire that may start two months down the road. An effective cure for this is committing to a meaningful Rule 26F conference. That creates a strong foundation for the remainder of your discovery and, frankly, the remaining parts of the litigation. So for a Rule 26F conference to be effective, it has to be meaningful, which takes planning, work, and thought. By going through the process, though, you're going to develop a plan early in your matter that will create a framework upon which the rest can be uh, built. And it really minimizes future discovery surprises. Despite being required by the federal rules, in my experience, this is a highly underutilized rule. Or, more often than not, if, it is, if a conference does occur, it's done in a really cursory, kind of check the box manner, right? The parties get on the phone for about six minutes and they say something like, well, we'll just deal with that when we get to the discovery phase. And that's not a solution to the problem. So this slide contains some of the highlights of Rule 26F, but the rule essentially requires that parties early in their case and prior to the initial case management discuss any issues about preserving discoverable information and develop a proposed discovery plan. So how do you have a meaningful 26F conference? You can't put your head in the sand. You actually have to do some work on it. To do that, you have to fully understand your clients, whether you're an in-house lawyer or an outside lawyer, digital landscape, including identifying the key custodians, what types of data might be uh, at play, and, 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 and if there are going to be any problems with that data. For companies with robust information governance systems, this can be a pretty, uh, pretty easy process. However, for those companies that are less prepared for litigation and maybe have less structured data, uh, you can have a user send emails from their home account or they're allowed to work on personal computers. Uh, or you have a lot of legacy systems, it can be a real challenge and take a tremendous amount of time. You have to start early on peeling that onion to try to find all of the different layers of data. I found that the most effective way of dealing with is speaking directly with your uh, clients' internal IT resources. And sometimes you may have to talk to a multitude of people and kind of spend time going down many different rabbit trails. Talking to one person is probably not going to do the trick. But I think a lot of times people will talk to one person for 20 minutes and, and check the box and move on. In addition to that, you also should speak to the key custodians. I found that these data interviews are extraordinarily helpful because I really begin to understand how do people store documents? Where do they keep them? Is there something, is there a rule that is set aside and the practice of the company is entirely different than what the IT people or even the legal department might think is happening. Not that anyone's doing anything wrong, they're just doing it differently. Whilst these interviews take some time, I have found that they pay off tremendously in gained efficiency and uh, it also is extraordinarily helpful in make sure and in, in ensuring that you are preserving documents. Data is very, electronic data is very fragile sometimes and it can be deleted and very expensive to retrieve if at all possible. So the faster you get to speak to folks and find where the information is and lock it down, the better. In, in my own practice, a few years ago I was conducting a data interview and the president of a company he hated an inbox that was, was, that was full of data. So what he did was he stored all of the emails that he wanted to keep in his deleted folder. His inbox had nothing, but his deleted folder was packed. Now, I knew this early on in the case, so I was able to set the expectation with my opposing counsel so it didn't look like he was being sneaky. It was his ordinary practice. He wasn't trying to hide anything. He wasn't trying to do anything funny. So before it looked suspicious or unusual, 
uh, we were, I was able to raise this with the opposing counsel and say, listen, when you get this metadata, you may see that everything's in deleted. He wasn't trying to be, uh, he wasn't trying to spoliate evidence in a, in a, in a, in a very bad way. He, uh, this is just his practice. It also allows the lawyer to begin to discover a thoughtful discovery plan that's tailored to the unique needs of a case. Each case is different, and each set of data is different. If you are able to uh, find and talk, you'll, 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 le you'll lessen the likelihood of finding unexpected data sets in somebody's buried in the, in the basement of a company uh, if, you, if you learn about it on the front end. Moreover, if you go into a scheduling conference and agree to deadlines on the front end without knowing this information, you may agree to, to deadlines that are essentially impossible to meet, given the volumes of data. And in my own practice, a lot of times that's when I get called in by a partner, somebody who has agreed to something and then later realizes that uh, it's going to be really hard to meet. Now, a lot of times through creativity, we're able to get there, but it, it causes people a lot of stress and anxiety. And timing's everything, right? So if you have something unique or difficult or something that's going to take a lot of time, if you raise it with the court at the very beginning of a case and say, listen, this is going to be hard, it's going to be expensive, and we may have some problems with our data, the court and your opposing counsel is going to be a lot uh, more receptive to that at the beginning than if you spring it on them as you are responding to your requests. In a sense, you're controlling the narrative and the information rather than, rather than the narrative controlling you. <laughs> Challenge number two. And this image of children wearing costumes and shooting silly string reminds me sometimes of my own e-discovery practice where I feel like I'm dealing with children. And, or when I'm reading uh, e-discovery cases and I wonder how on earth did these people end up before a court on this topic? Really, people are spending time and money to litigate this issue. I get it. litigators, we like to fight sometimes, but we don't have to fight about everything. And given the large numbers of issues with electronically stored information, I encourage people to really pick your battles wisely and avoid fighting over every point. Consider taking the high road sometimes and being the adult in the room. Case in point, in Mitchell v. Reliable Securities, it's a 2016 case from the Northern District of Georgia. It's a pregnancy discrimination case that ended up before the court on the format of production. And that's just one of those issues that should be sorted out very early in the case. It's not a big deal. The plaintiff requested that emails and electronic documents be produced in their native format, which is the document's true and original way of existing. It's how it exists at the company. The defendant, and they asked for this very early on, completely appropriately. The defendant refused and argued it was more burdensome to produce the documents in that format, just the one as they lived on the shelf, essentially. And they sought a court order, ordering that they had to be produced in PDF format, which required them to do more work and spend more money, right? position is utterly nonsensical. Now, there are some valid reasons why you might want to do that, such as if you're redacting documents. But that wasn't the case. They were arguing on burden. They were saying it was more expensive and harder for them to do it this way. There, I know there's always a backstory, and how they ended up there, I don't know, and I'm sure that there were legitimate reasons. But from the outside looking in, I'm not sure it's a battle that I would have picked. And it looks like lawyers just dug in. To make matters worse, and I think this is something also to think about, in support of this argument, they greatly exaggerated their costs and expenses involved, right? So now they're telling the court, it may be not true lies, but they're tweaking the evidence. The court quickly realized this, as did the opponents, and issued a sharp opinion pointing out the foolishness of their position. So here, defendants lose credibility with the court, lose credibility with opposing counsel, and I'm not sure if they advance the ball. And in fact, I probably would guess that they spent more money arguing about it than if they had just done it in the first place. So what's the cure to this? Before getting caught up in an e-discovery dispute over electronic evidence, stop and listen to your opposing counsel and maybe think about, is there a reason why they're asking for it? I've sometimes started to think I shouldn't just recept recept or reflexively say no just because they're asking. They may be making a valid point or have a legitimate reason. And frankly, I may have to be having an ask next month about something. So 
do unto others is a pretty decent rule in life and in e-discover, I found. Also, consider if the request is meaningful or whether fighting about it is going to cost more than, than just actually doing it. Once again, do unto others. The other thing is, if you can't fully agree, sometimes there's a possible alternative position that you can propose. Recently, in dealing with opposing counsel, um, and actually I've been doing this for a while, I found that if I say maybe, it's a lot more effective than just saying no. This comes up a lot in, with custodians and search, time, or search periods, where I can sometimes say, listen, you want 100 custodians? How about I give you 50? I'm preserving all the rest. We can go back to the well, but let's see where we are after doing that. You may have enough. More often than not, after we finish with Tier 1, we don't have to get to the proposed Tier 2 and Tier 3. People soon tire of getting mountains of digital data. And really, as I always contend, every case gets down to three notebooks. Once you get your three notebooks of hot documents, you usually move on. Despite all of your efforts, sometimes you do have to seek relief from court. Really, maybe there are going to contend that you need all 100 custodians. That's a fight worth fighting or the time period is affecting your legal position. So in that instance, you definitely want to uh, uh, go to the court and make sure you have solid evidence. Don't exaggerate. Challenge number three, large data volumes and not enough time. This is something that I suspect all of us in this room have faced, either as a client or as a lawyer, right? You have massive volumes of data and tight deadlines are a reality. And while this crunch is more manageable, if on the front end you have set expectations, we all sometimes get in a bind, right? And sometimes data collection can take longer than expected. You have vendor problems, but you get in a bind. So what do you do? Technology kind of got us into this mess. It's a lawyer who started off with paper documents at the beginning part of my career and now spend most of my time dealing with digital evidence. Uh, sometimes I, I have a love-hate with technology. I find it got us in here, but it's also helping us get out of the mess. Computer-assisted review, I encourage you, if you have not used it, uh, can be extraordinarily valuable for lawyers, both in reviewing documents that you receive and in producing it. You put your best resources uh, to look at the most responsive documents. The courts have approved this, and it can be very efficient and effective. I want to thank you all so much for your time today, and I really hope that these practical tips have uh, been helpful to you in your practice. Thank you.